I wanted to talk a little bit about the mothers and family members who came to speak today about the family's experience of fentanyl and how it impacted their lives. I know that we have gathered together to talk a little bit about this as a community at different times and it keeps coming up in the news, but I think it's really important to acknowledge the bravery and vulnerability of those who decided to come forward and talk about it in a way that really connects to our community. And I think there's so much value in hearing directly from the sources who have experienced these tragedies and experienced the true impact of fentanyl and related substances that are taking lives of the people we care about. And so certainly want to take a moment to just thank those families for speaking up and speaking out. And acknowledge the vulnerability and bravery it took for the, them to come and speak with us and be with us. I think that it's important to acknowledge that we are honored to hold space for that, for the vulnerability, for the tragedy, for the opportunity to share, to educate, to inform, and to see people for how they really are in the wake of something that was horrific. What I discovered about my history with substance use and my family history with it, the relationships I have had in my life with it, is that that gave me empathy that I would not have had otherwise. And it was the kind of empathy that says, I see you, I still care about you, I'm going to treat you with dignity and respect. Because in the same way that I still loved my family members who struggled, I love these clients in the way that is part of my community. I want my community to do well. I want these individuals to thrive and most importantly right now survive because that's the big issue is how many people are we losing while we're waiting to speak up? How many people are we losing while we're waiting to take action? The stories I hear in our agency every day are heartbreaking and yet it feels like we can't act fast enough and so Whatever history you have, whether it's something you talk about or not, with drugs and alcohol, I hope that you'll take this time while we're together to reflect on it and be welcome to share if you feel like it at some time here in the next little bit. Let us know how it's affected your life and do you feel called to make a decision to act in any way to help us get more lives saved rather than lost in this battle against a really scary experience? because at the end of the day, it takes each of us to be able to move forward in this experience together and survive and thrive is the next goal. So thank you guys for being here today. I look forward to talking to you more. Oh, look what you did. I disturbed her. Full setting. You can. Is that how we start? Yeah, that'd be fine. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm Angel O'Shields. I'm Isabel Guzman. So I'm a nurse practitioner. I've been uh, in the medical field for over 17 years. Okay. What else? <laughs> I don't have a list of questions <laughs> I'm going to ask you. It's going to be... Jessica, where's those questions? <laughs> Oh, mine was out. Oh, shit.
Just get out the shower. Dealing with this. This little thing right here. <laughs> So Levi Surrett is my son, her brother, and uh, he was, he had a huge heart and uh, big smile and one of the best huggers I've just ever, ever met. He loved very big and he forgave very easy. You know, the Lord always set us an example of, you know, how forgiving he is and how, you know, he sent his son to die on the cross for us. and. Uh, I always thought, God, it'd be nice to be so forgiving, right? Well, Levi was, he was so forgiving. He could be angry and say his peace. He wasn't perfect, but um, he could forgive like no other. And he never met a stranger, ever. <laughs> he took after my mother on that part. When we had his funeral, you could tell uh, he had friends that showed up that I thought were homeless, probably were, to kids that were very, very well off to do, or well to do, better edit that one. Uh, who had friends who were well-to-do, um, or at least their parents were well-off. And he, it was every range, every color, didn't matter. He was friends with them. In every walk of life, some um, had already started their careers, and you could tell some were still struggling. But he was friends with everybody. I thought if the Lord left him here, he would have quite a testimony. But that wasn't the road that he, he was going to walk. Um, we lost him. On December 5th, 2021, um, I got, I had talked to him the night before at eight o'clock and he was fine. He'd went out with his friends and, uh, and I'd asked him, I was finishing up Christmas and I said, do you want a haircut from Julie? That'll be the last present, you know, and a gift card to get your shoes. And he said, mom, that's perfect. I love you. And I said, I love you too. And then after church, his dad called me at like 1145 and said, you know, he had something to tell me. And I knew it had to be Levi. And I said, just tell me. And he said that we had lost him. And we didn't even know what time. And we didn't know how. At that point, we just knew. They'd be with his friends that night, and um, but he had went to another friend's house and had uh, taken a shower and fell when he got out, and that the friend tried to get him to go to the ER and that he wouldn't, and um, then he started snoring, and then his heart, yeah, everything he stopped breathing, and uh, they started CPR, and EMS came, and that's pretty much all we knew. We didn't know what time he'd even passed yet. And of course, you know, as a mom, when we lose our children, we lose them in different ways. But the feeling is the same across the board. Like your, your knees go out from under you, your world collapses. It's very hard. I really can't, I mean, your life changes in an instant. When you lose a child, it's, it's like you have a life before and then you have a life after. Nothing's ever the same. Your world is turned upside down. It's the worst day of your life. And it's just kind of a blur. Uh, there's so much you have to take into consideration emotionally, and, it, and it's just exhausting, of course. Nothing ever prepares you to bury your child. So of course, you know, I reached out to my family, my friends, and I was surrounded immediately. And lifted up and prayed for and got through the days like we had to do, made the arrangements and knew he was going to have an autopsy and it takes a while to get that back so still we didn't know. We had suspicions but we didn't know how we'd lost him yet. The days went on and someone asked me one time, they're like, how do you survive these days? And I tell them, I said, you know, it's just Jesus. He's the only way I can get through this. The night, you know, in the night, in the middle, especially early on, you would wake up in the middle of the night and there would just be like you couldn't breathe, like a knot in your chest. And I'd reach from my phone, which had my Bible app on it, and I would just read and pray. And it would slowly release because he's the only place I could get peace from. And we finally, I finally talked to the coroner. It was like three months later. 
And these peels that we're talking about, right, they're laced, we know that a lot of them are laced with fentanyl, but they're not just laced with fentanyl anymore. Levi, in his system, there was a Xanax and there was an oxycodone. And I had suspicions on the oxycodone because there had been a post that night on his Snapchat that his friend showed me later on. And it said, my friend has six oxycodone. And so I knew that it would probably be one of those pills in his system. Behavioral Health Services of Pickens County is a private nonprofit organization. We're our county's authority on substance abuse, but we do much, much more than that. We do substance abuse treatment, prevention, intervention, and we do behavioral health care. Those kind of issues can look like anxiety, depression, family issues, divorce, trauma, abuse, domestic violence, just a whole variety of things. We offer medication-assisted treatment for those who have substance use disorders like alcohol, and opioids. We have a few doctors that work with us part-time to be able to prescribe and, and monitor those medications. All of our services are outpatient and all of our services are voluntary, but we offer a lot of variety of services, different groups for adolescents, women who have been in domestic violence relationships. We have a batterer treatment program for those who've been convicted with criminal domestic violence and have to maybe comply with a court mandate to complete that program as well. We have a child and adolescent department. We serve several of our schools in our district. We serve on site at the schools. And those kids can be referred for lots of different reasons. It might be academic, it might be family, it might be relational. It could be a lot of mental health and suicidality has been happening with our kids, at least post COVID, we've noticed that. The substance use disorders have definitely gotten worse. With fentanyl on the scene, the lethality of substance use has definitely increased. It's heartbreaking and it's saddening to see so many people losing their lives due to a substance that is being brought into our community. I feel like our society is struggling a lot more psychologically and emotionally than they had previously, which does lead people to, to reach out to drugs and alcohol as a way of coping. So we try to make sure we address the person as a whole when they come in for services. Are you ready? Hi, I'm Marion Clinch, and I'm a physician here in Pickens County, and I've been a physician since 2005. And my, one of my main things that I just love is I really enjoy working with people who have drug and alcohol difficulties in their life and trying to get them, you know, better life and get them back to where they were. I work in my own office and we do addiction treatment. I work at Behavior Health and we help people who have drug and alcohol use disorders and we provide treatment and counseling and then also at the hospital we do some detoxification of alcohol and give them medication so that way they don't crave it and then they can go on their lives and get back working and be productive members of society. Oh, is, oh, where should I look? Look at me. Yeah, just okay. Yeah. okay. Um, what is fentanyl? Okay, fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that's similar to morphine. It is made in labs and it is used both legally in a hospital, it's used for surgeries, and it's used for chronic pain, cancer pain, and then there's also illegal fentanyl, which is one that's causing us all the problems. So what does fentanyl look like? Fentanyl actually, when it's made of the base, it's usually a clear liquid, then it's other forms, then they'll break it down and it'll be a white powder. The white powder also can be um, put on, the liquid can be put on pieces of paper so it looks like little dots, almost like back in the old days of the LSD where they would do little dots and people would use that. So you can see it in the dots and that's going into the schools. It's in the liquid form, it's in the powder form, it's pressed into pills that look exactly like pain pills that you get at the pharmacy. It's also put into other forms like it's put into marijuana, look like an Adderall, look exactly like a Xanax, Percocet, but it's not. It is fentanyl. So why do people take fentanyl? Fentanyl actually has a real high addictive rate and it's actually the high. It's 50 times more potent than heroin and 100 times more potent than morphine. The high, according to people who use it, is much better than what they would get of heroin. 
heparin also now is becoming more expensive, it's harder to get. Fentanyl is cheap and it's readily available. So how is fentanyl different from oxycodone and other opioids? Okay, most of the opioids are synthetic, but they're prescription and they're made in pharmaceutical labs. The illegal fentanyl is made in labs, usually it, in Mexico, and then they add other chemicals to it to break it down, get it into the powder form, get it in the form where they can press it into pills. So you mentioned a little bit about the addictive nature of it, but how, um, how addictive is fentanyl? Uh, fentanyl is highly addictive. Since it's an opiate, it's going to be as, as addictive, possibly because the high is a little bit more potent, so it'll probably be more addictive than heroin or morphine. Is fentanyl considered a controlled substance? It is a controlled substance, so the legal fentanyl is considered a category two, which is given prescriptions by physicians, whereas the illegal would be considered a category one, which means there is no known use for benefits in humans. So where is that illegal fentanyl coming from? The illegal fentanyl, most of it is coming from China. The base is coming from China. It comes in liquid form. It comes in big drums. They actually then transport it to Mexico. There is some that will come broken down in the mail, usually like places like New York, and so you can actually try to order some of it online, but most of it is coming through Mexico. Okay, so if I have the antidote naloxone, or Narcan, some mm -hmm. people know it as, is fentanyl safe to use? No, it is not safe to use but I recommend if somebody was going to be using it to have a partner and to have Narcan available. But no, it's not gonna keep you safe because it doesn't take very much fentanyl. So you can take a penny, a copper penny, and then you take a few grains of salt. Those few grains of salt are enough to kill somebody. So what should I do if I see someone who may have mistakenly taken drugs containing illegal fentanyl? Um, what you do is, if you think that somebody might be overdosing, then the first thing you can do is you're going to call 911. There is a, a law called the Good Samaritan Law, so you call EMS, you're not going to have to worry about getting in trouble going to jail. So no, they want to get that person the help. So you call 911 and you try to make sure that they're safe, you get turn them on their side, and then you go ahead and administer Narcan if that's available. and. Even sometimes one dose of Narcan is not enough and you need more than one. So you try to keep them alive. You try to encourage that they're breathing. You can do external rub, which is where you rub on their chest. That kind of keeps them awake, stimulates them. Okay, so what are the signs and symptoms of a fentanyl overdose? A fentanyl, if you come in the room and you might see someone slumped over, um, you'll see that they look pale their face looks, around their lips looks blue, their fingers look blue. You might notice that they might have some foaming of the mouth, they might be vomiting. Um, they might be struggling to breathe, so they'll be gasping for breath. They might have some tremors, but they're gonna be down and they're not gonna, they're barely respond to you. And so the thing, they might not be breathing at all. So you definitely would wanna get them some help. Overdosing from fentanyl actually can cause someone to die in a very short time. My name is Tracy Freeman. Uh, my son was Stephen Nicholas Cantrell. I went by Nick. Nick was born May 25th, 1988 in Anderson, South Carolina. Nick was one of those children that was a little mischievous, hard to handle. Um, the ADHD um, child that got into a lot of things, but you know, 100% boy, pure boy. Uh, coming up, uh, his father and I divorced, and um, I was the single mom with Nick for a long time, which was tough, and I know that that caused a lot of probably insecurity in him uh, moving around. He had to change school a lot of times, and Nick was one person that had a hard time making friends easily. Anyway, I remarried, had a second son, Luke, and for the first time really had the family unit. So he had that constant in his life 
went to church and um, I felt like he had the security that he probably always seeked and wanted. But still, Nick was the type that he just seemed to get in a lot of trouble at school. I would describe Nick as the one that liked to push your buttons. Highly intelligent, very smart, and with ADHD, he could hyper-focus on something that he really loved. You hate to say that he was a very smart person that did very dumb things, but he was just always very impulsive. So when he got into high school, it was at that time that he got his first job and he started stealing. Got into trouble that way. So a little time went by and he entered the United States Marine Corps. And it was when he was in the Marine Corps that he started lifting weights and unfortunately started taking steroids. Kind of like he had dabbled in maybe drug use in high school and teenage years. But when he got in the Marine Corps and started getting into trouble there, things started to escalate. Unfortunately, the Marine Corps ended with a dishonorable discharge. He was stealing things. He was an ammo tech stationed in Quantico, Virginia, and he was stealing things from there, ammunition and so forth. So he ended up with a dishonorable discharge. At this point, he really, he doesn't know what to do or where to go. And uh, he moved back to Anderson, South Carolina and started working as a waiter. Then he really got hooked up with a guy that was just a pill head. And I think the drug use really, really got really bad. It got so bad, he caused it his deepest, darkest time. There was some IV drug use then. And I think it was just various things, but mainly opiates. So he moved from Anderson to North Charleston, and it kind of just started a pattern of he would change locations, he'd get a job, he usually found a girlfriend, and that went well until things started to unravel. Either she would find the pills that he was taking, or probably through things I didn't know, uh, the relationship ended, and it hit rock bottom. So from there, he happened to talk to a guy that he was in the Marine Corps with that had grown up out in Overland Park, Kansas. The guy told him to come out here and be my roommate. He, tells, he told me that when he first went out to Kansas, he was clean. All this I did not find out until the last six months, four to six months before he passed away because this is a hidden drug problem. Like I said, he went out to Overland Park, Kansas and was roommates with a guy for about a year, then found another girl. She was not aware of the use of the opiates. She was aware of a little marijuana. After about four years, she broke up with him. So this was the first time that he was really alone. And um, he just, he, he couldn't be by himself. From July until he passed away in December of 2020, it was just watching someone spiral downward. He would call me six to seven times a day, and one time he'd be laughing, and the next time he'd be crying, and the next time it'd be something else, and it, it was just like, just watching a life deteriorate. He called me one day when I was working, said, Mom, I have a pill problem. And I said, I know you have a pill problem. And he said, how did you know? And I said, I know the signs. And from that point, I tried to get him to connect with a church out there and had started seeing addiction specialists there in Kansas City, but was still dabbling in drugs and um, just risky behavior on the side. I last spoke to him Christmas Day of 2020 and two days later I got a text from the girlfriend whose name's Sarah in Kansas and she just said have you spoke to Nick he's been a no call no show for work for two days and nobody has talked to him and I just instantly knew um, and as it ended up a friend of Sarah's went to check and his apartment door was unlocked they could hear the dog barking inside he had had the one corgi there and uh, the friend entered the apartment and Nick was face down on the carpet and he had been dead for two days. The toxicology came back and Nick had what they call designer opiates in his, his system. Uh, street drugs that have been manufactured. Um, a lot of times the drug dealers have a pill press and they can take 
things and they can peel press them into a peel that looks like an oxycodone or a hydrocodone that just came out of the pharmacy. However, these drugs are laced with fentanyl. Fentanyl being a substance that is, takes such a minute amount to be lethal. And the thing about the fentanyl is that it can't be measured. So a lot of drug dealers, from what I've been told, are lacing this, their drugs with fentanyl because I guess it's a better return on investment. Whereas in heroin, you've got heroin, but when you lace something with fentanyl, it's just as potent and powerful, if not more, but it takes less of it to get that addicted person high. Also, the addicted person becomes more addicted, more of the cravings and things like that. So when the coroner told me that his system had, of course, alcohol and uh, THC, but it also had cocaine, meth, heroin, and fentanyl in it, I was just taken back. And I was at work, and I was like, how can that be, Tara? And she's like, please don't think that your son went out and did all these drugs. She said these were actually in the pills. The oxycodone contained meth, cocaine, and fentanyl. And then the Xanax had heroin and fentanyl in it. And when I talked to one of my doctor friends, he said, for, especially for someone like Levi, there's not a system that could have held that, especially one that didn't do those kind of drugs um, all the time. And I spoke with another doctor friend recently, and I, I was like, you know, if they're trying to get people hooked, why are they killing them with these drugs, right? And her answer was, they don't care whether you die. What they care about are the ones that survive it. They're addicted, and they're addicted hard and they're much harder to get off of this. As a parent, as a, as a nurse in the medical field, I didn't realize the extent of this. I had no idea. Um, I never even thought about it, I guess, because it had never hit my home. Like it was, I was, you know, I raised my family well. It wasn't gonna happen to us. <laughs> yeah, you hear that all the time, but then it does. Um, so our job now is to educate um, families to start the conversations early. I do regret we never had the conversation of, you know, if you shoot something IV, you have no time at all. And uh, it looks as if that's what Nick did. He um, had melted the substance. At, at the scene, there was a spoon with liquid in it, or a white substance that was melted down. There was Narcan. There was a chair turned over, so it looks like that um, he injected the fentanyl. and was maybe trying get to get to the Narcan when he pushed over the chair and actually the needle that he used to shoot the fentanyl into his vein was up under his body. So I truly believe that he put it in and it was so quick that he went to try to get the Narcan, dropped the needle and fell right on top of the needle. There just wasn't any time, as um, sad as that is to say. Why do I come to work every day? Well, there's a lot of reasons. I actually began doing work with our organization when I was 14 years old. We have a really awesome program called Youth Board, and it's a group of students in Pickens County from all the different schools. It's almost like a leadership program. It gives them an opportunity to meet other kids from other schools, but to be able to then do something for their community. Our current Youth Board is really, really awesome. All of our Youth Boards have been awesome, but uh, these kids are, these kids are something special. I'm really, really proud of them. But doing that started in 1990, so it was over 30, 33 years ago, is when we first started the Youth Board in Pinkins County. And so I had the opportunity to be a part of that. And I'm really not sure what motivated it. It just, there was just something that said, hey, let's give this a try. It looked like, looked like it'd be fun. Always wanted to help people. It's just been part of something that I wanted to do. And so I thought, well, this looks really neat. Substance abuse has always been something that interested me. Every family has substance abuse issues in it. And of course, even our family had some in it. And so it was just an opportunity to be able to, to do something, do something for the community and for the school. I love working with our patients. I love working with our clients. I think they're so misunderstood. I think they're undervalued. I think that... They're some of the greatest people that you'll ever get a chance to meet. 
and get to know. I think that's frustrating for me to see people who don't look past a person's problems to see who they are and their value as a person underneath. And so I think that's been part of my motivation for all these years is that I truly believe every person has worth and value. And we don't know. You don't know what a person goes through. You don't know their story. You don't know what they've had to endure. And I'll be honest with you, I don't, I don't blame people for reaching out to drugs and alcohol as a way to cope with some of their issues that they've gone through in their life. If you only knew some of the things that people have to go through, it is not a healthy way to cope. And I hope that this place offers people an opportunity to learn a different way learn how to manage and cope and hopefully heal from their past traumas and their past issues so that they can be healthier and get what they deserve in life, which is happiness and hope and love and acceptance and all the other goodness that can be there for them. So I think that's one of the motivations is helping people see their value, helping people see their worth. I love therapy, but community outreach is also important. And part of that is learning about the resources and networking. I know that with Pickens County and some of the surrounding counties, we have a lot of really trustworthy referral sources that we work closely with. So when I do a handoff, I can trust that it's going to at least get there, get started well, and see where it goes from there. And so community work with that is just important because I'm working in my own backyard. So I feel like I'm giving back to directly the people that I'm neighbors with in some sense, but also they give to me. And that is something that's been really beautiful about this experience is it's not just about me being some educated counselor coming in and telling you how to do your life, you know, like, yeah, some days it kind of feels like that pressure to do that, not from the agency, but from myself. But as I learn more and experience more, it's that we're humans meeting together in a space and recognizing that we share a lot of things that we need to work through. And life is hard for each of us. And when I can hear my clients work through what they work through, it gives me hope and it gives me encouragement. And I just see a different future, not just for them, but for myself as well. And it's really rewarding. So I look forward to doing more of it, and I'm really excited about what BHS can do in the future. I think that our opportunities for more community growth and building and connection and integration is wide and vast, and I think we have a lot of great team members to make that happen. I love our staff. I I just, I can't imagine working anywhere else. I believe that the people that we work with here are truly some of the most dedicated and passionate and invested individuals into community work. And community work is very different than working in like a private setting or a hospital setting or something like that. And so our staff, I think our staff is what brings me back every day because they're amazing. They're awesome. All right. <clears throat> when you see a client, whether it's an assessment or your treatment planning appointment, please remember to talk to them about their drug screens being observed. Um, they're not going to remember, you know, from the very first time, just, you know, if you're doing an assessment before you send them back there for a drug screen, please make sure to talk to them. You know, I think Christian talks to them as well, but it's really important that we as clinicians talk to them. You know, I wanted to let you know today that your drug screen will be observed. Um, we have females that observe all drug screens. And so that if there's any questions or concerns that we're addressing those before we take them back to the drug screen room. Trauma-informed care. Yeah. Just to be trauma-informed is a part of trauma-informed care. I could not be more proud of the staff that we have and uh, how much they care for our patients and go above and beyond to make sure that they're taken care of and they get their what they need in their services so every day <laughs>
cocaine, heroin, any of the pills out there. There's a huge pill press situation that's happening in our community. And I don't know how to get the message across to people that your chances of dying is so much higher now than it ever, ever has been. You know, we think kids are going to experiment or you know, try this or try that. And, and in a way, some of that is normal behavior. But the risk is just too great. It's just too great now. The number of kids that we've had that were just out with some friends and they decided they wanted to try a pill, split it in half. One of those kids died, one of them lived. There's, it's like Russian roulette. You never know what's gonna happen. Our clients that are coming in services here swear that they've never used fentanyl, but their methamphetamine that they're using is laced with fentanyl. The cocaine has fentanyl in it. The marijuana has fentanyl in it. And they don't always recognize that it's in there. They don't know, they're not going out and seeking it a lot of times, but it's in there. And so they don't recognize the risk that's there. And I wished I had an answer. I wished I knew how to make it better. I, I wished I knew the solution. But I know that every year we have more and more people dying of fentanyl. The overdose rates, I think I looked at our stats, our overdose rates went up like 70% in this last year. And each year they keep getting worse and worse and worse. And I feel like we're trying, we're trying. We're trying to get the message out there. We're trying to you know, get Narcan out there in the community so people can have it to reverse overdoses and live. Nobody's gonna get better if they're dead. That's just a fact. You don't have an opportunity to get into treatment and get into recovery if you overdose and die. A lot of people complain that we give Narcan out to the community. It just gives people an opportunity to use again. No, it gives people opportunity to live, to potentially get into treatment, to potentially get the help that they need. Narcan actually is a lifesaver and some people do feel that hey you're enabling someone to go ahead and continue using drugs and some people that's their choice they like their heroin they like their stuff they're going to keep using it but if they overdose and we give Narcan that gives them another chance at life that saves life and if you have that thought well it's just enabling them but then if that was your child you would want somebody to give them Narcan because if they unknowingly you know, took something they didn't know had fentanyl in it. So Narcan is a lifesaver. Then we can go ahead and try to get that person help. So it is worth it. I heard um, a physician say earlier that you know, they, they have the Narcan and have Narcan on your, if you're gonna do these parties or whatever you're doing. But let me tell you, there was intervention immediately with Levi. His heart stopped, or his, he quit breathing, heart stopped at 429 when they started CPR in the morning, 429 in the morning. EMS was there immediately. They give Narcan, and they, re, they did CPR for over an hour. And I'm sure they repeated the Narcan, um, being in the medical field, but it didn't work. And he was 24 years old, and he died, you know, so. People that think that they can do this and just do the just do the Narcan reversal, um, it doesn't always work. The officer that went out that night on Levi's death told me that he had just got home from the same thing. He had just went out on a death. It can be really difficult when you have to start making those decisions while you're still struggling or while a family member is struggling. But I'm so glad we have those interventions now. And I hope that we continue not only to have the interventions, but also the perspective on what it is and what it is is a life-saving measure. It's not going to fix you or cure what you're struggling with. It's not going to fix or cure your family member or your loved one. And it's not intended to, but it is intended to help get you where you can get support and services and where you can talk to someone like me, I hope, who can at least help you migrate through that experience with a little more softness, even though you're in the absolute thick of it. It seems like every week 
I hear of someone else passing away, losing a child. Oh, everyone's someone's child. You know, even at my age, one of my schoolmates just passed away from it. You know, I'm, so it doesn't, the age really doesn't matter. I mean, they're hitting our children early on up to my age and I mean, even older. Fentanyl and opiate use disorders can affect anybody in any age, any age group, whether you're black, white, uh, rich, poor, come from another country, grew up here. It can affect everybody at any time, and it can be in any family, so nobody's really exempt. Hi, my name is Candy Garrett. I had lost my brother, Jonathan Keith Simmons, May the 8th of 2021. Growing up, it was me and my sister Chevy and my brother Jonathan. My brother had a good life. He was fun. You were laughing or you wanted to smack him. He had the best personality. Um, he was a great artist. He drew constantly. He struggled with some anxiety and depression at a young age, but back then, we just kind of overlooked it because we didn't know anything about it. He did go to a couple of doctors and some counselors, but nothing he really, nobody he really connected to at that time. When he was 19 and 20, he had three jobs, um, a good checking account, a brand new car. He met the love of his life, her name was Tori, and she died instantly from a health problem. And he lost her in 2012 and his world came crashing down. We seen a difference in him. He just, he was pitiful. He really was pitiful. He admired her. And from that day on, he, he made some bad decisions. He tried to self-medicate himself with any kind of pill. If somebody had a pill that made him hyper, he was all about it. He wanted it. He craved it. He had a problem. We tried to help as much as we could and be there for him. But if, if anybody had any kind of pill, he was asking for it. Well, um, early Saturday morning on May the 8th, he had talked to one of his close friends and the close friend let him know that he had some pretty powerful pills. Didn't know what was in it, but just said it was pretty powerful. So my brother uh, received two of those pills and half of, half of one of those pills caused him to drop dead in his floor that morning. And where my brother got it from was from a, is a family friend. This is somebody that he trusted. And just like any of these other kids and young adults or adults that think, hey, just because my close friend gave me this, it's okay. Because they don't know where they're getting it from. They're just trying to make a dollar. And I don't want any families to have to go through this because it's literally the worst thing ever. His friend probably didn't know that they were laced. I would hope not, you know, but um, you just, you can't trust that. Like if it's not, if it doesn't come from, from a provider prescribed from the pharmacy, you don't need to touch it. It doesn't take very much to die. And so the thing is, is, you know, you can test one pill and I actually spoke with an officer this week. You can test one pill and it maybe not have that much fentanyl in it or be fine, but the next pill you have in that same batch may be the one that's the death. Yeah. It only takes one pill. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit, um, I've always heard the term, the chocolate chip effect, mm -hmm. where like if somebody makes a batch of chocolate mm -hmm. chip cookies, there may be a lot of chocolate chips in one cookie and not as many in another cookie. Um, it's similar with pressed pills and illegal fentanyl. Um, can you tell us how it may be like if somebody overdoses and they've only taken a half a pill. How is that possible? Okay, so if you say you have a couple of gals, they're getting together, they, they get a thought with a Xanax, and a Xanax bar, you break that up in little pieces. And so they think, well, you take this part, I'll take that part. So one person takes a part, doesn't cause a problem, they get their desired effect. The other person takes a part but they have troubles breathing that. What happens is when they're mixing it up, there's like little chunks of the drug that is more potent. It's not getting mixed up properly. So you'll have one side of the pill that will have very concentrated amount and another part of the pill that maybe has a very small amount. So um, that's why you don't want to get any pills that are not picked up through the pharmacy because you don't know what you're getting and 
you might get a very strong dose when you thought you were just going to get a little weak dose, maybe get a little high, have a little fun with your friends, but no, your friend quits breathing or you quit breathing. So that's again, do not get anything that's controlled by or is given you by any belt, even a friend, if you don't know it came from the pharmacy. That Saturday morning, my phone rang at 6.58 a.m. It was my dad, and it was just weird for dad to call that early. He said, Candy, get down here. Jonathan's dead. And I said, okay. So me and my husband just threw on some clothes, and we ran down there. And that's when I seen my mom and dad at their worst. That morning was Mother's Day morning, and me and Jonathan was like this. <laughs> and I had always said that if it took me nine kids to have a little boy, that's what I would do. But luckily, the Lord blessed me the third one. <laughs> so um, he was 29. He had, you know, he had moved out on his own at times, and he had come back home when he was home. And I've worked EMS for 20 years, so I've seen all this fentanyl overdose. I've seen families hurt, but I didn't know what kind of hurt losing a child was. That kind of made me feel guilty once I lost Jonathan because I didn't totally get what it is to lose a, 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 a child. I had told him different points in times, you know, Jonathan don't never take nothing off the street because you don't never know what's in it now. The world's not like it used to be. That morning that I got up, I worked 24 hour shift. This is, this is my baby. I got up to, got ready for my 24 hour shift and when I come through the house, his bedroom light was on. And that was unusual. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna go in there and get this party started early because I like to aggravate him because he took care of our animals and you know, done stuff while I was at work for me. And so I walked down the hall and walked into his room and he's laying on the floor face down. Well, I thought he was aggravating me. I really did. I thought, I thought he heard me up and he's aggravating me, his light was on, fan was going, and I like kind of kicked him and said, Jonathan, get up, and he didn't move. And I was like, seriously, get up, I gotta go to work, you know, and like I said, it was Mother's Day. And then the EMS thing came in and it's like, be aware your surroundings is one of our main things. And when that came, to me, I noticed the fan was knocked over in the floor and his cell phone was out of his hand. And that's the moment that I said, oh God, this is for real. <sighs> and I reached over him and I shook him and I was screaming Jonathan. And I could tell by the way his body was because I've dealt with that so many times before. I knew he was gone at that point. And so then I started screaming for Tony because he was getting ready to get up to go out too, my husband, Jonathan's dad. And I called 911. I have no idea what I said. And then I heard the lady that answered, I heard her say, Cindy, slow down. I can't understand what you're saying. And we honestly thought Jonathan had a heart attack. We had no idea that it was going to be fentanyl. I think that's something important that we didn't cover, mm -hmm. really, that um, a lot of times these people mm -hmm. who are using those, those press mm -hmm. pills, their intention is not to, not to overdose. They don't want to overdose, and they, they mm -hmm. don't want to die, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, so they're, they're getting these pills, mm -hmm. and they're thinking it's one thing, and then it ends mm -hmm. up having fentanyl in it, and they're experiencing mm -hmm. this overdose that they didn't, they didn't want. Yeah, and also um, um, in the schools, some um, kids are bringing pills in the school that are colored and it's called rainbow fentanyl and they're packaged in um, candy boxes and they'll look just like candy, like sweet tarts. They're like, oh, that looks good. You know, you get a little sweet tooth, you're hungry. Hey, I'll take one of those. And so now in the school systems, the teachers are all having to be trained in what to do in the event of an overdose and also having Narcan available. And that's sad, you know, to have to have that, you know, when you have a junior high age kids who are taking pills and then find out they're overdosing. 
and those kids are not intending to overdose. They're not addicted. They just are kids and they have teenager brains and they think, hey, that looks good, let's try it. Because their friend told her, oh, that'll make you feel good. Or, you know, college kid will want an Adderall because they need to study for an exam. They go take an Adderall, which they think is an Adderall, and then they find out they fall asleep and thank goodness their friends are there with them in their um, rooms, you know, their roommates, because that person all of a sudden is turning blue and quit breathing. And that's scary. So there's too many needless deaths in this day and age that don't need to be there. I, as a parent, knowing that I couldn't do anything about it, the, the message you got to get out there to the young people. The young people's got to realize that that this stuff will kill them. Um, you, a parent can preach it all day long. I feel like, yeah. You know, there's no telling how many people these kids at school has lost their friends. They might not know it was from fentanyl because some families don't want, because I never thought that stuff would cross my door. My door, I'm EMS. I go out and try to save people from that. So I never thought that that would ever come into my house. You can't say that this can't happen to you. Or it won't happen to somebody in your family because it's happening to people every day. And we have a responsibility to the people in our community to keep them safe and to keep them healthy. And so something's got to give. I just wished that I just knew how to, how to fix the problem. Oh my gosh, I would love that so much. I would love to actually be able to do those things. That is fantastic. So. <clears throat> You know, our community directly is impacted by fentanyl, but we're also seeing it affecting communities all over the country. And in addition to fentanyl, we're seeing things like xylazine that are kind of those uh, designer drugs that are popping up as well. So we're having this issue where as soon as we learn something, something new is coming into the market and really affecting that risk. And a lot of what I talk about with clients when we talk about substance use education and awareness is about risk. How do I know when I put things into my body, whether it's food, whether it's drink, whether it's substances of some sort, what do we know about it? And fentanyl is one of those things that can be really confusing to a lot of folks because we know about it and yet we continue to have risk of using it. And so that's part of why addiction is what it is. What's the word? It's almost like an invisible enemy, right? So you know it's out there, you see what it does, you can't quite get that. Like you can't get your hands on this thing that's causing all the problems. We created the opioid crisis, you know, the, the pharmaceuticals and all that, and now it's hard to get them off of it. So then when we as providers are taking them away or controlling them more, then they're seeking them on the outside and the drug dealers know that. And we start thinking, okay, I've seen people I care about die. I've had tragedies I hear about it in my community and yet here I am struggling with the same kind of things that could put me at risk and we talk about that a lot in treatment of like why did we get there you know how did I get here how can I see that person go through that and still be using and that's part of the process and it can be really devastating to know that you you know are having a hard time overcoming that but I've seen so many people here who genuinely do overcome it and part of that is that risk awareness and starting to be real with yourself about what's out there and one of the first steps is possibly getting fentanyl test strips or Narcan so that you know you have it in your first aid kit and you know that you have it whether it's for you or someone else and being able to have that hard conversation of goodness forbid if this happens to me this is here and I hope it works and I want it to work and I want to understand why this is important Fentanyl awareness is something that I'm really glad that our state has picked up in terms of Embrace Recovery and all of these different pieces that are coming together to raise awareness, raise funding, but we keep, keep having to do more and we need to keep doing more. This is not something we can let up on because the risk is too high and everybody that has that risk is worth saving.
Go ahead. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start us off. This is just kind of an announcement for clinical staff. And I, I even quit paying any of his bail like it would. he would have to do it because it was a lesson that he just had to learn. And he hated it. He hated it. He didn't like being in jail. He's never once called me to get him out of jail. He <laughs> knew I wouldn't get him out. <laughs> I loved him to death, but I wouldn't get him out. Oh, they were very close. Um, he, he would call her. Go ahead. He would call me every day. I used to ride racehorses, and he knew about the time that I would ride this one racehorse off the track. So, like, I had, I could, I could be on my phone. I could talk. I was alone, and I'd ride the horse for about an hour. And he talked to me for the entire hour. I think he called me almost every day. <laughs> He was just persistent. Today. He was very persistent. <laughs> he loved his sister. I just think that as a community, we need to recognize the seriousness of it and, and get the word out. But actually, I have a couple of patients that I use um, as examples because, like, I have, um, you know, one gal, she came in one day and her hair was all messed up and she looked ragged, she hadn't slept. And I go, what's going on? And she came and I need help. And her mother brought her in. And then she finally um, told me that she had a problem with abusing pills. And it was causing a problem with her family and her husband. So then we sat, talked about it again. And I told her some options that she could do regarding treatment. I'll never get my son back. It's a terrible thing. But I knew when I started to find out the information about the drug dealer, it was, I could not not do anything with that information. I never want another parent or another mother to get the, the call that I got. So that's why we're walking through the, the justice system, so this doesn't happen to any other parent. And he had come back home when he was home, and I've worked EMS for 20 years, so I've seen all this fentanyl overdose. I've seen families hurt, but I didn't know what kind of hurt losing a child was. Thank you both again. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Yes. So yeah, I mean, it's not that life is not good anymore, like I say, life is different. And uh, there's happy times, but you'll always have that missing, it's like a missing piece of the puzzle, even when there are good times. Um, my middle son got married the April after Nick died in December. My youngest son graduated high school and went into the Marine Corps. So those were happy events, ceremonies that Nick should have been at, but you know, was remembered. So, um, a life lost, and uh, a soul that's gone, and uh, it breaks a mother's heart. But, I mean, God's given this storm to us to use us for some type of purpose, and I want to do my best to get the, for Nick's honor, and, and to remember Nick. I want to get the story out about anything I can do to help prevent this happening to anyone else. So she decided she wanted to get her life back and keep her family together and so she went on um, medication and now it's been four years she has not touched a thing, um, anything illegal, no um, pills, no alcohol. She feels great, her family's back together. Um, she continues and she's um, tapering off some of the medication that we've used to um, help her in her struggles. And she's working full time and she's doing awesome. And she looks 10 years younger. That's great. And I wish I would have taken before and after pictures, but I use her as an example of how you see someone who's struggling it just looks like they were going to fall off in the street and now they their hair's all combed and they look great they feel great and it's just like a whole different person pickens is a small town and so i guess if i wanted to be it could be embarrassing on how i lost my son the way i lost my son right maybe i failed him but it's happening and if we don't talk about it, there's going to be another mom and dad and a sister and brother without 
without their child, they're a sibling there anymore. So no matter how you feel or if it'll make your family look bad or, you know, whatever, you just, it, it shouldn't matter anymore because your child's gone. And so uh, unless you want someone else to go through it, and I don't, this is, this is just hard, um, we just have to talk about it. And appreciate y'all putting this video together and, and getting this word out.